sensation, Mike Tyson. Cut out of the same brawling mold, Tyson knocked out a string of 19 challengers in just 12 months. With a display of awesome punching power, he's become the sport's rising superstar. But in his last outing against James Quintillis, he went 10 tough rounds. Tonight, New York hosts Mike Tyson versus Mitch Green. There may be no title on the line, but this building is alive, as if tonight is a heavyweight championship fight. We're live from Madison Square Garden in New York City, where HBO Sports presents the main event, a 10-round heavyweight fight between Mike Tyson and Mitch Green. So a rising star has made his way to an arena steeped in boxing tradition. Three heavyweight champions continue on in the unification series as Mike Tyson awaits his chance. Ironically, Michael Spinks, Tim Witherspoon, and Trevor Burbick have never even fought in this historic building. There was a time when Madison Square Garden was a showcase for names like Lewis, Marciano, Ali, and Frazier. And now, as we store those memorable nights away, a new force has emerged in the heavyweight division, reawakening a sleeping giant. Madison Square Garden is latched on to Mike Tyson as boxing returns to the main arena, a thread which ties boxing's glorious past to a promising future. Fight night in the garden. They used to say it a lot in Madison Square Garden, but they haven't said it about heavyweights here in the big room since Ken Norton fought Jerry Cooney more than five years ago. Hello, everybody. I'm Barry Tompkins, along with Sugar Ray Leonard and Larry Merchant, and we've got what should be an interesting evening for you tonight. Ray, the legend of Mike Tyson, the man might have just become a little bit more mortal. He went 10 rounds with James Quick Tillis. What's the pressure like on him? You went through pretty much the same thing. I tell you, Barry, I would prefer to fight an opponent than to deal with the pressure. It's really tough because, see, the fans, high expectations when a celebrated fight like a Mike Tyson, it's every day because everyone critiques you in a different way. It happened to me when I first turned professional. Everyone expected me to be champion. I did become champion. For Mike Tyson, I'm impressed with the fact he's only 19 years old and very composed. Well, Mike Tyson is only half the fight. Larry Merchant, Mitch Blood Green is the other half. What does he bring to the dance? Well, if he doesn't pose a real threat to Tyson, he definitely poses a challenge. He's definitely the, the toughest character that Tyson has been put in with yet. And by that, I mean just a tough guy off the street. How tough? Well, he asked to fight Mike Tyson. The last time we had that, Trevor Burbick asked to fight Pinklin Thomas. We thought he was crazy, and he went on to pull up a 7-1 to one upset. So who knows about Mitch Green? In fact, Mitch Green was the guy who fought Trevor Burbick just before he pulled off that upset and gave him a heck of a fight. So Mitch Green, a tough kid from the streets of the Bronx and Harlem, Tyson from the streets of Brooklyn. We're here in the garden. In the old days, that's how they used to settle these neighborhood wars. Interborough battle is what we got here. And so the selling of the quote, next heavyweight champion continues. If you talk to Mike Tyson, he'll have to say he's gonna bite the promotional bullet. He asks about his feelings. And of course, people, he says, people consider him a commodity. Like many 19-year-olds, Mike Tyson is preparing for finals. But he is not your average student. He doesn't read his lessons, he watches them. He doesn't attend classes, he skips them. But most importantly, he does not plan for his future. His future is being planned for him. In the 14 months since Mike Tyson made his pro debut, he's become one of today's most exciting and publicized fighters. The foundation was laid by the late Customato, a legendary trainer of champions Floyd Patterson and Jose Torres, who proclaimed his student of the 80s the next heavyweight champion. In the past year, there's been a building process taking place. The architects are Tyson's managers, Bill Caton and Jim Jacobs. As the owners of boxing's largest film library, they've utilized their knowledge, expertise, and contacts in the career development of boxing's latest sensation. Our chief responsibility has been, over the last year, uh, to pick the opponents for Mike Tyson. Nothing, nothing is more important than the opponents you pick for a fighter. The strategy was to pick opponents he would not only beat, he would beat devastatingly. 
when someone sees a Mike Tyson fight, we want them to leave the arena saying, when can we go see him again? And that's where Bill and I are scrupulously careful in determining who he fights and the style of the fighter. But it would take more than pulverizing unknown opponents in obscure arenas to get the attention of the press and public. After his fifth fight, we decided the time was at hand for the marketing of Mike with a technique that had never been used before, simply because video cassettes were never really available to a manager before. We prepared cassettes of all of Mike's fights and sent those cassettes with a covering letter to the top sports writers and top television personalities throughout the country. Wallace Matthews of Newsday, with a circulation of over a half million, was the recipient of a Mike Tyson marketing tape. It really brought Tyson to the attention of a lot of people who hadn't seen him, myself included. In addition to Kate and Jacobs, there was also a support group whose involvement increased the awareness and interest in this 19-year-old phenomenon. Boxing promoter Jeff Levine, whose company could provide national television exposure, was hired. The fact that a good part of the country was seeing the knockouts and the explosive power, um, I think that was what created that mystique to begin with. Other interest was generated by publicist Mike Cohen, whose television and newspaper contacts added more fuel to the fire. And when we sat down in that meeting uh, with uh, Levine, Jacobs, and Caton, the 100% A1 strategy was to go after the non-sports fan, to capture the fringe sports fan and certainly the fringe boxing fan. According to Cohen, this was achieved by selling Mike to the so-called newspapers of influence, such as the New York Times, the L.A. Times, the Chicago Tribune, and the Wall Street Journal. It's said the press can make you or break you, but if you're Mike Tyson, its value has been priceless. Michael Katz, one of boxing's most respected writers, can attest to the importance of the press. The press plays a very big part in the sense that uh, if the promoter or manager knows how to use the press, uh, you get the amount of ink, the timing of the ink, uh, in such a way that getting a title shot pays. Anybody can get a title shot if you want to pay for it. The idea is to get the title shot so it pays you. Based on the amount of exposure that Mike Tyson has received, it's fair to say that should he fight for the title, his dollar potential will have been maximized. The press's attention is, is really basic to the success of a fighter in terms of the money that fighter could make. The bigger the press, the more prominent the fighter becomes, the greater purses he commands, the more interest he generates. Fourteen months ago, Tyson was earning under $1,000 a fight. Today, separate deals with ABC and HBO have brought in over $2 million for eight fights. I don't believe there's ever been a fighter who has reached this prominence this quickly in the history of boxing. It would therefore seem as if Mike would enjoy being in this position. Yet, like the pigeons he raises at his Catskills home, a feeling exists that sometimes it would be nice to just fly away. But can I tell you something? People wouldn't want to be in my shoes. They really think so because they say, wow, I can make money, I can get rich. But if they had to go through some of the things I had to go through, I think they would cry. It was, it's sometimes it's so depressing you got to go through. Like, everybody's always, they always want something. They want to find a way to get your money. It's always people just as hard as you work in a gym. It's people working that hard to separate you from your money. Despite the pressure, press, and notoriety, Mike Tyson does not regret where he is. He's just a 19-year-old whose only desire is to become heavyweight champion. Personally, I feel... I'm doing my job 100%, and I expect them to do their job 100%. The results are foregone conclusion. There's no way we could fail. We must succeed. Thus far, the plan has succeeded, but what's yet to be proven is will it stand or will it crumble? Well, it didn't crumble the last time, but it did wobble ever so slightly. Tonight, the garden is the stage for the Mike Tyson story, Chapter 21. Now with more on the marketing of the hottest ticket in the heavyweight division, here's Larry Merchant. Mike Tyson is an awesome prospect, a prospect in the, in the process of becoming a fighter, a challenger, a champion, all in the next week and a half when he's going to fight 10 times. Just kidding, folks. But it does seem that already, prematurely, he's being treated like some sort of human trash compactor, expected to go out there and just grind everyone into powder. And if he does anything less, it's failure. 
So let's just remember that even the best prize fighters let some opponents standing and the critics clucky. And that he is just 19 and that he's been a professional only for 14 months. And he still has much to prove that his punch will do as much damage to the better class of fighters as it did to the less better class of fighter. That he'll be able to take a punch, that he'll fight back when he's hurt, that he'll persist when he's frustrated, that he'll be able to go 10 hard rounds. And most importantly, that he'll be able to deal with stardom, not let it suffocate him, let it inspire him so that he can shoulder the burden of other people's expectations. His expectation tonight is to beat Mitchell Green, but Mitchell Green, like him, is off the streets of New York, not Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. I'm not no boom. in the home he was so good. Mentality. You see what I'm saying? Now, if I said, okay, do me as you wish, 
I get a title shot. I'll be broke, but I'll be a champ. <laughs> Who wanna come home broke with a, with a belt? And if he had to fight Mike Tyson to get a shot, okay. Even if friends think that's going too far. Tyson, buddy. Huh? I don't think you can mess with Tyson. What he gonna do is might hit him, and, and when you hit a guy, and the guy don't move. Okay, he can't mess with Mike Tyson, right? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Mitchell Green has taken on Mike Tyson's on the streets all his life. Tyson, I ask you, I'm gonna break your neck. You can't fool me. Look at me good, like I told you before. This is Blair Mitchell Green. The one all those fools with duck, and I haven't had a chance to fight. And I was losing my desire for the fight before the fight game until you stepped in my lap. Well, Charlene Green, ringside, very nervous lady. We spoke with her yesterday. She, of course, as we mentioned, has really been very much of a stabilizing factor in the life of her son, Mitch Blood Green. She hates that nickname. She said so in that piece. And it's been a fight that Mitchell Green seems to have been fighting for the better part of this week. We talked in that piece a little bit earlier about his jumping up and down and shouting. Well, that's exactly what he had to do at a press conference, or rather at a weigh-in yesterday. I never drunk nobody. Well, he said that he doesn't have a championship mentality. And here's another example of it. At the weigh-in, he raised a ruckus, tried to extort more money from his manager, Carl King. And I mean He knew what he was supposed to get, but just thought he'd, he might get a little bit more if he raised a little heck. And Mitchell Green now making his way down the hallway and it's a very short walk up to the ring here. Should point out one other thing too. There was a story released a little bit earlier today by the New York Post and spoken about on some of the local television newscasts here in New York as well, that the New York Police Department would perhaps arrest Mitchell Green either before or after the fight. Well, the story is there is a minor warrant for harassment that was issued on May 13th for Mitchell Green. The official statement of the police department says it's a violation, it's not a crime, and after the fight, Green's agent will be informed of exactly what action the police department will take, and it could be an arrest, it could be a fine, nobody really knows, but that is the official word. In the meantime, Mitchell Green has some business to take care of. Here's a look at the record of Mitch Green, the one loss to Trevor Burbick, the draw early in his career, 10 knockouts. We saw him as far back as his amateur career. He was always a very spirited, very tough kid in the ring. Not a classic style, but he'd fight you. And he's made no bones about the fact he wants to get in there and go Dukes with Mike Tyson. Of course, the question is, can he do it? And Mike Tyson, traditionally, no robe. No socks, he says it makes him feel like a warrior. Makes him feel like a gladiator. Well, no matter how much money he makes, he'll never squander it on his wardrobe. <laughs> I asked him to see the wearing socks. <laughs> right, well, Ray, you were talking to him about that yesterday, and, and we were talking about the fact that really it seems like it would just be uncomfortable if nothing else. He just loves it. He says it just makes him feel like a warrior. It makes him feel like he's ready to go to work. In fact, he is. Hector Camacho takes a shower with more stuff on him than that. <laughs> and he's a guy who, again, you know, we've used this before, but he's just a no-nonsense guy. He's here to do a job. He's a very low-key kind of guy. He comes into the ring now well warmed up, and that's another thing that you've talked about on numerous occasions. Oh, he's ready to go to work, perspiration on his body. Look at his facial expression. Very serious individual tonight. He doesn't look like to me like he's going to get any roles on Dynasty. Right? No, I don't think so, or the love boat, for that matter. 24-3 record as an amateur. He says he plans to have the title by age 20. Fighting twice a month, that's been pretty well documented, but should also point out that in his first 16 fights, he only fought 22 rounds. And here's, here's a, a graphic that shows how many fights in the first years as pro as some former champions. As you can see, fighting a lot doesn't guarantee you'll be a champion, or just fighting a little but it's not that unusual in the context of boxing history. And a tale of the tape, of course, a 10-year age difference. I'm not sure how much of a factor that will really be. The reach advantage for Mitchell Green, but the height advantage could be significant, Larry, if Mitchell Green decides to make it significant. Right, because it looks to, to me that Tyson is closer to 5'10 than six feet. 
so that may be a little exaggeration. And there you can see in our punch stat just how many punches these fighters throw. And that Tyson rations his aggressiveness. He just doesn't come out and throw punches from all over, but he throws hard punches and not a lot of jabs. Green, as you can see, is more active. And there you can see we're going to track the body punches tonight that Mike Tyson throws. Although, as you see, he threw as many as 20 in a round and as few as nine in a round in his last fights. But that's, he's a devastating body puncher, much like Joe Frazier. And there's Mitch Green's jabs, not a very high percentage that he's landed. Let's take a look at the rules then. Scoring by rounds here in the state of New York, but there is a supplementary point system in case there is a draw in the terms of in rounds. And it's a one point system. If you win a round, you get one point. If you win it decisively, you get two. Three knockdown rule is in effect. And that's something you don't find in championship fights as a rule. No standing gate count. You can be saved by the bell only in the last round. That's pretty general. And the ring doctor unusually can stop the fight here in the state of New York. Well, there's a look at Mike Tyson, and he really is a throwback. Well, he's Right now, let's go up to the ring announcer, and Dar Darian, rather, for the pre-fight introductions. From the beautiful Madison Square Garden here in the Big Apple of New York City as well as the Empire State of New York, Don King Productions and Madison Square Garden proudly present New York is Busting Out, a scheduled 10-round heavyweight bout. is approved and sanctioned by the New York State Athletic Commission, the former light heavyweight champion of the world, Jose Torres, Chairman, Rose Tretman, and Jimmy Dupree, Commissioners. The Chief Physician in attendance at ringside this evening is Dr. Frank S. Folk, along with his two fine colleagues, Dr. Billy Lathan and Dr. Richard Estrico. The judges, Pat Dolan, George DeGabriel, and Georgie Colon. Counting for the knockdown seconds, alternate referee, Carl Duke Schroeder. The timekeeper de Bell is Cecilio Pedraja. In the ring at this time, the man in charge of the scheduled 10-round heavyweight bout, referee Luis Rivera. And our boxing fans, introducing the principals. First, in the red corner, wearing the white trunks with the black and red trim. He tipped in at an even 225 pounds. This gentleman has 16 wins, one loss, one draw, with 10 knockouts. He is ranked number seven by the World Boxing Council from Queens, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mitch Blood Green. Green. And his opponent in the blue corner, wearing the black trunks. He weighed in at 215 and one quarter pounds. This young man is undefeated in 20 professional bouts with 19 knockouts. From Catskill, New York, ladies and gentlemen, here is Mike Tyson. Tyson. Little question as to the public choice. I want a clean fight. Protect yourself at all times. Any night down, go to the following room for and I stay there until I tell you to come out. Three night down, we don't defy automatically. Protect yourself at all times and listen to my commands. Check hand with the bells out of my fighting bull up. One of the things we're going to have to see here is whether the quick tillage fight was a meaningful learning experience for Tyson or whether it exposed the weakness he's always going to have to fight to overcome. Let us also remind you that we have ringside our own unofficial judge, Harold Letterman, who is, of course, a judge in the state of Nevada and was so much a factor in the last fight that we showed you here on HBO, that between Larry Holmes and Michael Spinks. Round one, Mike Tyson right on top of Mitch Green. Just as expected, uh, Mike Tyson comes out like a locomotive going straight for Mitch Green. Green, uh, what he's going to have to do to be successful is to box. Pretty much do the same thing. Uh, a boxer should do to a, a puncher. Keep that jab in his face and not be intimidated well, by go, his puncher power. Mike Tyson and 
Vince Cornerman, Kevin Rooney, his trainer, were not real pleased with the Tillis fight because they said, both of them said, that he didn't double up. He just was a little bit lazy, especially in the later round. So we'll see what he does about that against Mitch Green. Well, Mike Tyson told me the fact that he was somewhat uh, a little reluctant to go full steam because he was going 10 rounds. I had that same experience when I fought my first 10 round in Baltimore against Rafael go, Rodriguez go. Barry. It's, go, go. it's in your mind, you know, the fact that can you go additional two rounds. But being conditioned like Tyson, there is no major problem. Heavy-handed fighter. They say heavy-handed like George Foreman, but much faster go, 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 than George go. Foreman. And just kind of getting over the butterflies of the first round. And he has them. He told us he definitely has a fear when he climbs into the ring. He says, I think any normal human being who says they're not afraid, not nervous when they get in a boxing ring is either crazy or lying. What is your adrenaline? It's that anticipation of facing uh, your opposition, uh, knowing that he's capable, and the fact the crowd here, who are definitely for Mike Tyson. And he, of course, will be quick to credit Customato with his overcoming that fear and that nervousness. In fact, he credits Customato with his career period. It's a story that has been told many times and will develop it as this evening goes on. Well, Mr. Green is complaining about the, uh, the head of Mike Tyson. You see what's happened? Tyson is not allowing Mitch Green to punch. He's staying right in his chest. He's smothering his punches, staying close to his punch, staying close to his opponent. It's similar to Joe Frazier. Always aggressive, right in front of his man. Now we see some head movement by Mike Tyson. That was about a three-punch combination by Mitch Green, Ray. But once again, it looks like Green is off balance when he throws his punches. Well, the mistake that Mitch Green makes is the fact that he doesn't coordinate his, his fist. He's slapping his punches. And uh, you have to make a guy like Mike Tyson respect you. Have to get those punches in and get him in shop. That's the uppercut that was... Um, that was working for Quick Tillers. Remember, this is only the first round. It's a very up-tempo first round. Good uppercut there by Tyson. And shots to the body. Another thing that uh, Mitch Green is doing, he's trying to tie up Mike Tyson. He's not doing too, too good of a job now. He can't allow Tyson to get inside and work his body. Because in doing so, those body shots slows down your uh, maneuverability. That punch did land after the bell. Yeah, just a little bit more. Green, Green tapped him into the game. That's where you're going to come back punch like that. How do you feel? Great. All right. Give me a little water. A little sip. Not a boy. There you go. Spit it out. Spit it out. Here you'll see, after the bell, right there, that last punch, a, a grazing punch. Leave it. You understand? Oh. When you get inside, tie his arms up. Tie him up when you get inside, like this. You understand? Double the jab, straight right hand. Keep that steady pressure. Tyson's late mentor, Customato, taught what has been called the peekaboo style, holding the gloves up close to the face while you're coming forward. He wanted his fighters to be entertaining and aggressive, but not to lead with their chins. And you'll see that that's what Tyson tries to do. The tactics that Mr. Green wanted to use was to tie his man up once he gets inside to stop him from punching and work to the body. He's not been successful, mainly because he's not tying his man up right. Got to grab those arms. You heard Mitch Green's no corner no tell him, tie him up in there. Incidentally, the peekaboo style of Mike Tyson is different than that of some of Customato's former pupils. I'm sure Larry Merchant will talk a little more about that, but his gloves are actually down around his chin rather than up on his cheeks. What, I, what I'm looking forward to seeing, whether or not uh, the, this clinching by Mitch Green is going to frustrate Tyson because it has a tendency to really uh, frustrate a fighter. Good left hand by Tyson. Green got a couple of punches in, but as far as how solid those punches are, there's no comparison. Now Green holding and hitting. He, in fact, he should get a warning here from Mitch Green from holding behind the head. See, and again, Ray, it just strikes me 
that Mitch Green throws an awful lot of punches off his back foot, which it seems would just take away all the sting. Well, also, he, he Mitch Green makes, has a bad habit of leaning back. Watch the left hook of Mike Tyson land. Every time Mitch Green moves backwards, he has to keep those hands high. He shouldn't be inside with a fight like Mike Tyson. Tyson's arms are shorter, so he's able to throw quicker shots. There's the left hook I was talking about. Those short shots, Barry, are very effective. The other thing that strikes me, Ray, is that Mike Tyson just seems to be right on top of his man before his opponent even gets a chance to take a breath. Well, he, st he stays right in his opponent's chest because what happens by him being so close, it compensates for his height, the disadvantage. You notice that there is no mouthpiece in Mitch Green's mouth. He was knocked out by a left hook. Green needs to keep that mouth shut. To Green's credit, he hasn't taken a backward step. Whether that's wise or not remains to be seen. You know, it's time and time again, that left hook and those little short shots. Very effective shots. This is not the type of fight that Mitch Green want to have. All right, break. Come on, break. Stop back. I told you, stop holding on punch, man. And he did draw a warning from Luis Rivera, the referee, about holding. Green's in trouble. Those shots to the body is doing it, taking his toe. Really working. A lot of body, a lot of leverage. The body shots. Watch for the left hook. There it is again, Barry. As advertised, it's, inside of 10 seconds. That hook is getting shorter, more powerful, and more effective. The uppercut's working beautiful for Mike Tyson also. That was a good round for Mike Tyson. Very impressive round. Getting all of his shoulders into every shot, it seems. Tie the man up when you get inside. You ain't got to punch inside. Tie him up. You understand? Throw the one, two from the outside and tie him up. One, two, tie him up. Don't fight him inside. You don't have to fight him inside. Tie him up. One, two, jab and jab. Move this round. Move this round. When you get inside, blood. Stop fighting his fight. Move this round, throw the one, two, okay. and tie him up. All right. You understand? Give me five. Blood. That's up. Give me this. Blood. Get him on the outside. Hold up. And when he get inside, tie him up. How you feel? How you feel? Okay, keep it up. Keep the pressure on. Just keep moving. Just, just keep moving like that. Stay right on him and keep punching on the inside. You're doing excellent, baby. Real good. Let's go. Come on, Tim. When Blood Green was a gang leader, they say he had over 100 men in his gang. Right now, he needs some of them. And again, Mike Tyson bolting out of his corner right on top of Mitch Green. Tyson is so much physically stronger than Mitch Green, and he's using it to his advantage. Mitch Green is doing the wrong thing. He's fighting Mike Tyson's fight, trying to fight him inside, trying to exchange punch for punch. He can't do that. Tyson's far too strong for Mitch Green to fight that way. He needs, Mitch Green needs to get outside, work his jam, and attempt to outmaneuver Michael Tyson. That's exactly what Green's corner. Green has been bleeding from inside the mouth, and I can't help but wonder if maybe he might not have suffered some jaw problems when he lost his mouthpiece in that last round. When his mouthpiece was knocked out of his mouth, he kept his mouth open. Again, Barry, you have to watch these little short shots thrown by Mike Tyson. Very, very effective. Inside, it can do a great deal of damage to the mouth. You know, the last fight that Tyson had against Tillis, and what a shot. That is an awesome shot. That was just a jab. You have to appreciate one left jab, and the mouthpiece is gone once again. Started to say Tyson and his people weren't happy about the fact that he had a hand free in a situation just like this against Tillis, and he didn't take advantage of it. But is he doing that tonight? Well, the problem he's making, he cannot um, keep Mike Tyson off of those little inside shots is really busting up the mouth of Mike, uh, Mitch Green, I'm sorry. Yeah, there was blood inside the mouth even between rounds, as we mentioned. It can't help it. He's breathing through his mouth. Barry, watch the left hook. The left hook is doing a great deal of damage. Come on, step back. Come on, do your work. It's inside. It's short. Less than six inches. Even the uppercut of Mike Tyson has been effective. That was a right hand at the top of the head. Green breathing through his mouth. Tyson keeps that, that chin tucked in, so it's difficult to hit him on the, on the chin. Hands high. 
He works his way in. That was a right hook. The man possesses so, so much power, he has dynamite in both hands. It really is impressive. And whatever punch that he's able to land against Mitch, it has a tendency to shake Mitch up. Those big board shoulders, big arms. You see the exposed area to the body. You have to think, Ray, that maybe the Tillis fight woke him up. Well, it reassured him that he is a conditioned athlete. He can go 10 rounds, so there's no need for him to slow down the momentum. Both hands. Go! It's obvious that Mitch Green just doesn't use Very good. Very good. Very good. the body he has. He's tall, he's got a long reach, but he doesn't use it. You're doing excellent, but you can't lose. He's holding it up. I know he's holding it. You keep the hand that's free, you just keep hunting. Dig in, get mean. Keep, keep the meanness in there. Keep the meanness in there. Now here we see why the, the mouthpiece come out with that left jab, and in fact, why it's so difficult for Green to move, because Tyson looks quick in there, and he looks like he surrounds him. And here's the card of our official, unofficial judge, Harold Letterman. Larry, so far, Mike Tyson is awesome. He, he swept the first three rounds with clean, hard, effective punches. Uh, he's staying right in Green's chest. He's just running away with it so far. Oh, yeah. Mike Tyson <laughs> anxious to get to work. I want to mention one other thing, too, and that is that it wasn't only the mouthpiece that Mitch Green lost. We have a production assistant up on the other side of the ring. Mom right. said in addition to his mouthpiece, it was a bridge with a couple of teeth in it. That'll just give you an idea of how tough Mike Tyson is. Mike Tyson, in this ring, he's at home. I mean, he fights with so much authority, so much confidence, so much break. determination. Come on, step back. Come on, step back. I said break. I said break. I know you got punch. Fight for you if you keep on holding. If you don't the referee now is warning uh, Mitch Green for holding. Second time he has warned Green. Now, Green scored with a right hand, and it didn't slow Tyson up a bit. Now, Tyson's doing what he didn't do against Quick Tillis. You notice when he's, when he's tied up, he still let works let the uh, go, free hand. He didn't let do that let against let Quick Tillis. Good left hook, solid left hook. Green cannot continue to take these type of shots. It's going to slow him down. It's going to take his toe. Working the body once again, Mike Tyson with that free hand. The last time we saw Mitch Green in a preliminary fight go, on the Touch Witherspoon go. card, Ray, lost his mouthpiece nine don't, times. Don't score, don't score. Is that any sort of indicative of anything in particular? A lot of times it's fatigue and also it's a way uh, that fighters get a breather. Left hand, top of the head. Right, right. On, a lot of on, times, on, because of the damage that's done to a person's nose, they have to breathe through the mouth so they get rid of their mouthpiece. Not a smart thing to do because their mouthpiece protects you from a broken jaw. Green now waving over to his corner to let him know that he's okay. But instead of dropping that right hand, and the left hook of, of uh, Mike Tyson is very, very effective. That was another big shot right there by Tyson. Right, right. Come on, let it go, let it go. Very good, very good. You notice that uh, Tyson walks in, keeps those hands high. He's a very unorthodox fighter who punches with both hands, and which makes him a quite a difficult target. Yeah, in fact, that's what he says. When we asked, I asked him yesterday what his best weapon was, and he said, my elusiveness. He has said nothing about his punching power. He said, I'm elusive. That's what I do best. And very, he's quick. I mean, his hands are faster than people expect or think. Now, see, this is. This is how I got knocked down by Kevin Howard, by moving around too much. You gotta slow down a little bit. When you get lateral movement, you don't need your excellent exactly one. Just move from side to side and stick the jab, but snap it. You gotta draw it back quick. Inside of 10 seconds. A free hand to the body. And that's something that he did not do against Quick Tillis. Yo, 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 yo. Come on, come on, come on. 
They don't have any bells on the street corners. Wait, 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 w
he, Michigan will have to do more than just slap because he has to stop that momentum no, 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 of Tyson. No, no, no. Come on, break. Come on, break. That's Step what back. Tyson said about his own style. He says, like water on a rock, but if it drips long enough, it's going through the rock. Look, you notice the jab, the powerful jab of Tyson. It knocks the head back. Wishful thinking in Mitch Green's corner, too. They were telling him that Tyson's getting tired. I don't see that. I doubt that very seriously. Tyson's just as strong as he was on, in the very on, first back, round. On, He's go, maintained his pace. On, He's back. thrown a great deal of punches. He's made it to the midsection. He's landed with a, a lot of good left hooks, solid left hooks. One thing you have to give to uh, Mitch Green, he has a durable chin. He's taken some tremendous shots, body and head shots, from Mike Tyson. Green is able to land one, one jab, and break, all of a sudden, back. Tyson's right there in his chest. Another big left hook. Just to conclude the thought that we started in the last oh, round about Tyson's going 10 rounds, he said after he finished the Tillis fight, he did pace himself, and what a right hand. There is such frustration in the face of Mitch Green. I mean, every time he throws a punch and it misses, it seems to me that uh, he wants to just walk away. To conclude that, he said when it was over, he felt he could go five more rounds. He's conditioned, all right? You notice that when he goes to the body, he doesn't throw one punch, he throws two, three, four shots. I like the fact that Tyson used what he has. I mean, he has power, he has speed, has a good chin, and a huge net. I mean, he is so tenacious. He's not letting up. Keeping those hands high. Come on, let it go, let it go. Come on, break. Come on, step back. Come on, step back. Ha having gone to 10 rounds against Tillis, right, you could see a different fighter here as we head into the last five rounds of this one. It's only a reassurance that he's capable of going 10 rounds at full speed. Look at here. You can tell that he is not concerned about going the distance, um, throwing those shots combination to the body and he is he's come done on, this on, on, from, from the very first round and not breathing look at him he's not breathing at all And we want to remind you that coming up, the making of a rivalry, will it become fact or is it still wishful thinking? We'll look at the potentiality of Hagler versus... Uh, uh, Come give me a break, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> and the car. Well, We've got a shutout going here. Absolutely, Larry. Dwight uh, Gooden. <laughs> Mike Tyson is just awesome. Uh, they took the fourth round away from Miss Green, but it didn't mean anything. Tyson's all over him, and he's throwing those tremendous left hooks. He's all over Green. It's all Tyson. It will be interesting to see what he does from here on out. Because it was from the seventh round on against Tillis that he sort of coasted. And he finished with about a third of a tank of gas. We're talking about Tyson. So let's see if he uses up that gas here. This is round number seven. I like the tactics of Mike Tyson. Come on, come on. He's uh, not wasting Very any good. energy. Um, he's moving forward, staying aggressive, getting inside. And you have to watch the beauty of those little short shots. They've been working so effectively. <laughs> Now we see a, a couple left jabs thrown by Mike Tyson. What is, what, there, there again, Mitch Green is throwing his punches, not doing any damage. Now they're almost just for effect. The free hand yeah, again of Mike Tyson normally goes to the body. Is this a good test, you feel, for Tyson? It's a, every fight for Tyson is a good fight, a good test. 
Uh, you got guys that, uh, especially like a Mitch Green or Quick Tillis, guys who, because headboys will be taller, the average headboy is around six feet, and he's able to cut the ring off and become more tactical in the ring. Chopping right hand did get in, but again with absolutely no damage. Come on, it's not wrestling. Come on. Come on, let it go. It's not wrestling. Boxing. I mean, Tyson, they're a good uppercut. What a beautiful. Uppercut. Just straighten Mitch Green right up. If you look at Tyson, I mean, as far as perspiration, it seems as though he's working effortlessly. I mean, he's taking his time and just having fun. It's like chopping a tree down. He's going to the body and uh, weak, weak in the foundation, and then he comes to the head. All that um, Mitch has been doing, Mitch Green has been doing, was basically retreating. He has to take the stand eventually. Another couple body shots. Come on, let it go. There's the free hand for Mike Tyson. Now, using that much more than he did in his last go with Tillis. I mean, Tyson is actually concentrating. He's looking for his opening. And he's making that opening happen by working that body. Look at the uppercut. And he's setting, his, he's setting Mitch Green up for the uppercut. He throws his left jab, Green goes down, and up comes the right uppercut. A lot of booze from the fans, mainly because that Mitch Green is doing a lot of holding. And less fighting. Green is taking a pretty good beating. Taking a lot of punches and a lot of hard punches. Tyson's not that impressed with the screen. We're not booing you. You feel right? Let me get that water. He's steady, Mike. He's stuck right now. He's a deep. He's deep. Just get Stay right Just now. Just Just now. But every time you take a jab, you don't miss this guy. You understand me? You don't miss him. This is the round to concentrate on the jab. Now, box him, box him, get over there. Yeah, come on, come on. Come out with three or four punches, blood, like you do on the bag. Bam, bam, bam. You understand? Get the jab out there and come on. Combination behind the jab. What's wrong? You understand? Don't let him get inside and hit him with upper cups. Keep him outside. You got to get him. Hit him with shots, okay? Check it out. Come on, baby. The crowd wants magic. And I think that Tyson would like to give them some magic. But his opponent isn't cooperating at the moment. He's not acting like a girl who's letting him pull rabbits out of his hat. He's fighting with a lot of neighborhood pride, and he wants to hang in there as long as he can. Mitch Green told, told well, him to, uh, to throw two or three jails like it. Like he uh, does in a bag, but the bag doesn't hit back. Tyson That's... hits back. Come on, let him fight, man. Come on. Come on. Tyson Come on. is not breathing hard. This is the eighth round. It's been up tempo for Mike Tyson right from the opening belt. Actually, a little bit slower this round than he has been. A little bit more leaning going on in this well, round. He, he would throw, Tyson would throw more punches if uh, Green didn't tie him up. That was a good attempt with that right hand for Tyson. And now we see uh, Mitch Green. He landed with a good uppercut there. Green just trying to tie Tyson up and a couple of good shots by Mitch Green. His best rally of the fight right here. Look here. No. He's caught Tyson four or five times and Tyson for the first time seems a little bit puzzled. Well, he's smiling. Tyson is smiling, but see, Green has those fast hands. Good body shot by Mitch Green. Now we're seeing a different Mitch Green. But he has to be very careful of changing punch for punch inside with Tyson. There was There's a right hand. A huge right hand by Mike Tyson. Come on, go right.
it's just even sitting 30 feet away like we are makes you wince. Oh, well, you can you can you can feel the impact of his punch. See, also Mitch Queen is not tying his man up properly. He's holding behind the head, which he allows those shots like that to land. When you tie a man up, you hold the grab around his arm. That was another good shot to the ribs by Tyson. Tyson said one time, he said, I understand anatomy. Here again. Oh, what a left hand. And this is going to happen all the time because, again, you see the way that Mitch Green has his hand behind the head of Tyson. Watch Tyson. She goes to the body here. See the body shots. Yeah, but close, a little close. You gotta throw a little bit more. You gotta throw more. You understand? A little bit more, Mike. Come on. You let him have a big round. You understand? He had nothing left after that. That's kid. Sit it out. You don't miss him with any of them. Take a deep breath and let out stuff. Come on, baby. Deep breath. Take another one. Get right on his face this round. Ninth round, baby. It's a ninth round. You understand? Yes. Now, he made that round close enough to steal. Let <laughs> me give that one to him. That was a first. I don't want to give it to him. You get out there and take it. Kevin Rooney is in there and just jabbering away 100 miles a minute. Mike Tyson leaned over and just kissed him. Right that water on air off the floor. Clean it up. You got a flood there, guys. This is an awfully good fight for Mike Tyson. It indicates that his management wants to get him tested. They want to get him into a position not where he's merely going to be maneuvered into a title fight to fight a title fight, hey, hey, hey. but that somewhere down the road he will have had the training to win a title fight. Tyson draws a warning for headbutts. Ty Mitch Green has to keep those hands up, which if he moves to the left or moves to the right, mainly because Tyson he throws a looping right hand or left hook. One would have the feeling that Mitch Green will not be out boogieing on, tonight. Go, right, go. Come on, no, those come body on. shots will stop you from doing the uh, Pee Wee Herman. Stop That's you from doing the waltz. Tyson is using, you know what, what I feel, Barry, he's using what he has. I mean, he's not what you consider uh, flashy and what have you. And um, he's just taking advantage of every opportunity. He fights his man the way his opponent lets him fight him, inside, which is a big mistake that Mitch Green is making. Tyson's arms are short, so he has a tendency to loop his punches. Some are somewhat telegraphed, but because he has speed behind his punches, he's able to get away with it. Continuing to bang away at the body with a free hand. That uppercut was short. Mitch Green is not making this fight easy for Tyson either because he's he's steady tying him up. He's holding him. Let it go, let it go. I think the way you critique uh, Tyson's performance is the fact that he he's remained composed. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Normally, this type of fight frustrates a fighter. When the guy's holding you and complaining and what have you. Tyson's corner wanted him to punch a little bit more. He hasn't really punched a lot more in this ninth round. It, well, again, it's difficult to punch a man who's tying you up and holding. Let's see here. Oh, let it go, let it go. For Mitch Green, it's, it's pretty much survival. I've seen a different Mitch Green. He fought Purcell Davis in Atlanta and was a more determined and a more of a, a boxer. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Here he's basically just trying to survive. Come on, I said break, man. 
that seems to be something that runs through all of Mike Tyson's opponents, that they all are in there to survive. I'm not sure that could be said about I don't Bush know Green. if Mike Tyson is living up to your expectations, but I'd remind you that Joe Lewis went the distance three times in his first 20 fights, Joe Fraser a couple of times, Rocky Marciano a couple of times in his first 21 fights. Some opponents just don't cooperate. <laughs> Harold? Larry, uh, I just don't think that Mitchell Green's flurries are doing enough to offset Tyson's power punching. Tyson's landing too many clean, effective shots. You might stop him, blood. Go punch him. Go to punch him. You understand? Punch with both hands, blood. Step to him. Don't wait on him. Step to him. Step to him, blood. He's going to punch like that. Curious here, Ray, whether Tyson will be satisfied to go out winning or does he want to go out closing the show in a sensational style? Well, the way he's geared up now, he wants to go out in style. You want to see a very aggressive Mike Tyson this round. Tyson was ready to go. Luis Rivera said, shake hands before we get going. This is the last round. Tyson wants to go to work, but uh, Green here doesn't want to fight, it appears to me. Green's corner telling him to step in to Mike Tyson. This is a bad performance for Miss Green. And uh, he has some briefs with Don King about not getting the type of money that he wants, but the fact is, he has to prove himself here. And the mouthpiece yes. goes again. He has to prove he deserves the money. Green trying to go to the body. Tyson leaning on him now a little bit. What's going to happen? Um, as um, Tyson gets further and further into his career, he's gonna figure out a better way to approach fights like this. Those shots, are the, I love those body shots. They really do a number on a tall opponent. It slows him down and uh, cuts his win off, especially if you have the power. But as I was saying earlier, Barry, the fact that this, these type of fights is good for a Mike Tyson because he's gonna learn how to approach tall opponents more tactically. You learn how to cut the ring off and uh, even score more effective punches. Moving that head very well, Tyson. Took a couple of shots, but still. Only problem I forward. see with, the, excuse me, Barry, the only problem I see with Tyson is the fact he comes in sometimes with those hands down a little too low. Because if you meet, meet a good puncher, the speed uh, could prove to be disastrous. But now he's, he's, doing, he's doing a job. Well, remember, he knocked out his first 19 opponents, went the distance with Tillis, and now likely will go the distance with Mitch Blood Green. The crowd not real thrilled with the goings on here. The crowd come in to see a fight, boxer puncher, and um, it's been uh, pretty much of a dance for Mitch Green. I'm sure Mitch Green is going to be disappointed uh, in this performance. And we come to just about the end of it here. Another day in the classroom, big left hand to end things. Yo, yo. So Mike Tyson has gone 10 rounds for the second time in less than a month. What do you say, my good friends? You know, it's very Mitch Blood Green, perhaps not being quite as accommodating to Mike Tyson as Tyson and some of the fans here would have liked. Well, I think it was a good performance for Mike Tyson. I'm sure a lot of people would disagree, mainly because what you have to look at, the fact that he went 10, 10 good hard rounds with a fighter that uh, was not you know, cooperating. Take a look at the punch that, as you can see, he was pretty effective with his punches, and there weren't a lot of jabs in there. He threw a, a great deal of punches. 
more so to the body. Uh, Tyson del delivered a great deal of body shots to Mitch Green. Green didn't fight at all to me. Did a lot of holding on and not effective. Scoring with six out of ten of his punches, and that's pretty high percentage for a guy who really is a power puncher like Mike Tyson, I would think, Ray. Well, Tyson is a slugger. He's the puncher, and uh, he worked in a, a very good way. He stayed close to Mitch Green. Green did not do anything but a couple of... Uh, of left jabs. Is it, a, is it a detriment you feel to a fighter where the image of Mike Tyson is he's going to knock everybody out who he gets in there with? Now he's gone the distance on two successive fights. Is it a detriment just to kind of build that kind of expectancy in the public? Well, he just has to do what he does best, and that's work the body like he did. People are going to uh, be so opinionated anyway. Let's take a look then at Harold Letterman's card. And, Harold, you pitched a shutout here. Well, well Barry, as I see it, you know, in the eyes of this judge, you can't get points for holding, uh, for taking a good shot on a jaw. And that's basically what Mitchell Green did. He held. Louis Rivera took one round away, warned him 100 times. But Green held and held and held. The closest I thought Green got was the 10th round. But even that, Tyson won. You know, I mean, there's the old thing of Styles make fights, and perhaps in this case, Styles unmade this fight, if you will. Mitch Green really wasn't willing to be the cooperative opponent that the crowd and Mike Tyson perhaps would have liked. Let's go up to the ring announcer now, Ed Darian, for the official decision. Ed? Ladies and gentlemen, from Madison Square Garden, we have a unanimous decision. And a scoring by rounds as follows. Judge George DeGabriel observed the fight 8-2. Judge Pat Dolan watched it at 9-1. And Judge Georgie Colon observed the fight 9-1. For the winner, for his 21st straight win in as many fights, Mike Tyson. Tyson. Well, to nobody's great surprise, Mike Tyson is the unanimous decision victor over Mitch Blood Green. And at a time like this, oftentimes we say an opponent was dead game. I'm not real sure we could say that about Mitch Green tonight. He did manage to take Mike Tyson's best punches, but I think really that's about all you could say about the opponent. Well, Mitch Green was not a fighter tonight. All he did was try to survive, Barry. I was quite disappointed in Mitch Green's performance. He did nothing. Right now, Larry Merchant is with the winner, Mike Tyson. Let's get up to the ring and Larry and Mike. Larry? Mike, this is your, your first fight here in the big room at the Garden. Were you satisfied with it? Almost oh, definitely. I didn't, um, I don't want to sound brutish or anything. I didn't want to knock him out or anything. I wanted to put a lot of pressure on him and make him himself whether he has to give up or not. He, won't, he wouldn't get knocked out. If he get hit on the chin, he don't, can't see the punch, and he'll say, oh, I didn't see the punch, I got knocked out. So I left it up to himself, and as I, as I must say, I must take my head off. He's a very tough individual. That's a little bit odd. You're saying you didn't want to knock him out because you hit him some awfully tough punches for a guy who didn't want to knock the other guy out. Well, they were tough punches, but they weren't devastating punches. They were rugged punches. Boom. Because I knew he was a professional, and if he would have went down from the punches, he, that would have been the fact that he gave it up. That's his problem. Your, your, is it your goal just to win it as quickly and as devastating as you can? Most definitely, but I wanted to give a 10-round good performance, which everybody liked. How would you rate this performance as against the Quick Tillis performance, and what did that mean to you, having gone 10 rounds, perhaps not as satisfactorily as you would have hoped the last time? Oh uh, Well, those things happen. As you say, I had a seven-week layoff, and going 10 rounds, I'm telling you, it's fun. I'm having a good time in there. I saw something I never saw before in a fight tonight. While your trainer was jabbering away there between rounds, you just sort of leaned over and kissed him like you were having a good time. Because we, we knew we were going to win this fight so easy. In the paper, everybody, he was going to knock me out. But we knew deep inside that I was going to win this fight so easy because of his style. He's a dang tough opponent, and he took some fairly decent shots. But as you know, I won comfortably, and I didn't try for the knockout, and I used a great deal of discipline in there, not knocking him out. Customato, your old mentor, wanted you, as all of his fighters, to be an entertainer, to excite the crowd. They were excited today. Did he? Did he? In the last few rounds, uh, there was a little booing. Do you think it was for you no. or because he oh, wouldn't yeah. fight you? Yeah. When, the, when the decision was up, who do you think they, they cheered for? There was no boos. You know, they booed because he was pushing a bug, and he bumped oh, my head. He, he was bumping heads with me. 
Are you on track to the heavyweight title? What's your schedule for the well, heavyweight championship? In this predicament, um, you have to talk to the charming gentleman on my left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll do that another time. He's talking about Jimmy Jacobs, his manager, which reminds me of something. Jimmy Jacobs is the only guy I ever knew who had three greatest in front of his name. He's the greatest handball player who ever lived. He's regarded as the Babe Ruth of his sport. He has the greatest collection of fight films in the world, some 98% of all the fight films ever made, 26,000 of them. And he has the greatest collection of comic books in the world. Every comic book, every published in America has gone to a warehouse in Los Angeles. And now he wants a fourth greatest, to have the greatest fighter in the world. Does he? Well, there's still a way to go. There are still questions to be asked and answers to be questioned about Mike Tyson. He hasn't yet proved that he's the second coming of Marciano and Fraser, but he does seem to be getting there, slowly but surely. Now back to ringside. Okay, thanks, Larry Merchant. A couple of quick notes from our punch stat numbers. Mike Tyson connected on 69% of his body shots. The other side of that coin, he connected on only five jabs per round. That's a low number, and it may just be that there was a lot of holding going on and that he was on top of his man all night long. He couldn't get the distance to try to jab. So there are some rather interesting numbers, I think. Let's now switch gears from the heavyweights. A couple of weeks ago, the man next to me, Sugar Ray Leonard, made an announcement catching everyone off guard. You'll see the potential now of a Hagler-Leonard fight, and it's been one of promise and disappointment for years. The fight has been five years oh, in the yeah, making. Oh, On yeah. numerous occasions, we've chronicled the confrontation outside the ring. The public is aware, and it's no secret, that before my injury, you and I was pretty much on a collision course. Now, be honest, do you still want to fight me? I did, because I'll tell you why. Uh, you feel as though that when you train so hard and you're the best in the world, you want to keep growing, Ray. And for you, that was another step, and there was uh, another way of growing. The people want to see it, Lenny. We don't want you to retire yet until you come with the marvelous one. Okay, It's got to be the big one, right? I must start off by saying to Dr. Ronald Michaels, thank you. You know why? Because very few people get a second chance. It was so easy because um, to say, well, I'll prove I'm different. I'll walk away from the ring. But in doing so, I was not satisfying myself. And I, I, I really feel that I have to satisfy Ray Leonard before I satisfy my fans or family or friends. Well, Ray Leonard, let me ask you your impressions of Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Coming into the fight, they say he hasn't really fought anybody very tough. Well, he fought somebody tough tonight. Well, I think uh, Hagler's display tonight, it only it made me believe, it made the public believe. While Ray sat ringside as a commentator, oh, oh, Hagler destroyed the division. Well, the fight is simply saying he doesn't want anymore. He doesn't want to jeopardize anymore, especially by being handicapped in the condition of Rodin. There was a right hand, and Ron Domingo Rodin goes down. It's not a comeback, I'm back. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome, for the first time in the ring since February 15th, 1982, Sugar Ray Leonard. For Sugar Ray Leonard, it was to be a one-night stand. There's a swelling under the left eye now of Kevin Howard. Ray went on to retire with Marvelous Marvin as an interested and disappointed observer that night. Ray returned to the microphone and watched Marvin crush an old foe. And again, it's a matter of accumulation of punches thrown by Hagler, which is probably where coming down. I'm sure Marvin feels that he has gotten to hurry things up here because that cut is not going to get any better. There's no question about it. Right hand says, no, he doesn't know where he is. Hagler goes in for the kill now. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. One year later, hey. this startling announcement hey. from Sugar Ray Leonard. Hey. This is something that I want to do. Marvin wants it also. But um, I'm not making an announcement. I'm just saying okay. I would fight him. I'm not coming back to fight uh, to have a career. Right. I've had a career. Right. I want something that's going to give me what I want. That's Marvin. I, I would fight him. Public reaction has been one of wonderment, doubt, and bewilderment. Hagler's made only rare public appearances since Sugar Ray's challenge.
And now there's talk uh, that you might not well, fight him. Is that, is that true? Well, you know, right now, it's really hitting a lot of press. I think basically just has an ego. He's on an ego trip or something. Uh, yeah. Maybe a little jealousy. Or he's missing the limelight a little bit. But uh, the way that I feel about it, I'm just going to sit back and I'm just going to lick my chops. <laughs> like that. And just, and just wait. No. <clears throat> but, uh, John, what I'm going to do is yeah. uh, next month we're going to hold a press conference and, uh, and then I'm going to answer uh, Leonard's challenge. And uh, I may say, yeah. He is the undisputed middleweight champion of the world, introducing Marvelous Marvin. Sugar Ray Leonard. And so the spotlight once again shines on commentator slash boxing champion Sugar Ray Leonard. Ray, let me ask you the question the way it's been asked by my friends to me who know I know you. Are you crazy? Are you nuts? Are you out of your mind? And most important, are you serious? Well, the fact is everyone's so, you know, opinionated and they deserve to be that way. Everyone uh, has a, a right to make their own uh, judgment of people, although sometimes they don't rationalize. I'm doing what I want to do. I'm very serious. I uh, offered an invitation for Marvin, and uh, he claimed that I was egotistical and that I missed the limelight. Those things are not true. I mean, it has nothing to do with me. The fact that I'm ready to challenge him, I mean, he has a good fight, an easy fight. He should consider the fact that I've been ring for two years. Uh, but I know Hagler. I, I think he's going to go for Hearns, which is a relatively easy fight, which was proven some time ago. And uh, I'm sure that's what he has on his mind now. Sounds really like you're trying to bait Marvin, and I don't think you're as serious about that as you say. But I have a couple of questions to ask you. Question number one. After you fought Kevin Howard, who is just a journeyman, and it was a good test for you coming off two years, but he is a journeyman. You said you hurt every time he punched you. You forgot how it hurts to, to get hit. Do you want to now go in the ring and get hit by Marvin Hagler? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, I, when I fought Kevin Howard, it was too premature. I'll be the first to say that I jumped uh, too prematurely into the ring without conditioning myself first. Now, I feel this way. Uh, I learned how to study my trade. I've been there in the gym now for three, four months and I'm preparing myself to take a punch. One, one lady asked me some time ago, she asked, do you have to get your face in shape to take a punch? I laughed, I thought it was crazy, but it's true, you have to get used to being hit again. The next question, there have been two famous comebacks in the recent history of boxing. Sugar Ray Robinson took off well over a year to try an entertainment career, it didn't work out, but when he came back, he took some meaningful tune-ups before he challenged for the title. Same thing with Muhammad Ali when he was in exile for three years. He took two tough fights before he challenged Joe Frazier. He wanted to see where he was so that he can get in shape for the best guy out there. So I don't understand how you can just go out there, no matter how much gym work you've had, without testing yourself against an opponent. I can't because it's me, Larry. I, I feel this way. I know I'm capable of doing it. I know I can be marvelous, Marvin Hack. The shock is the fact that, not because I want to fight him, it's the fact I want to do it right away. I don't want a career, like I stated earlier. I don't want to go in the ring and fight a series of fights because I know exactly I'm capable of beating Marvin Hagler. I think the other side of that coin, too, is, and it's really a bottom line question, what's in it for Ray Leonard? You're financially sound, you have the spotlight, you, are, you have a good career, you have almost anything that anyone could possibly want for. What's in it for you? Marvin Hagler, that's why I'm going to beat him, because it's not for financial needs, like historic, you know, history has proven. Fighters come back for financial reasons. It's not for the ego, the pride. I'm here on HBO. I love it. I'm going to fight Hagler. Hagler always wanted to fight me. He may deny it now and claim he want to lick his chops and whatever, whatever. But the fact is, this is something I always wanted. But this is not the same fight as it would have been three or four years ago when you were on top of your game and the boxing game. And when he was the number two guy, it's, it, it, no matter what happens in the fight, it's not as if the great Sugar Ray Leonard fought the great Marvin Hagler. It's a Sugar Ray Leonard who's fought just one little old fight in four years. So it's not quite the same thing. That's true, though. I mean, I, but I've been wrestling for two years. He's been beat around for two years, okay? It's a big difference. <laughs> You've got yourself convinced of nobody else. Thank you. <laughs> but there's also the old adage, and we said it about Larry Holmes, that you don't get better when you get older. Well, you reach a, once you reach a peak, you don't go high, you go down. The fact that I'm 30, and I admit that. Hagler's 31, 32, 33, give or take a year. And uh, 
it's an easy fight for him. He should take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that sort of took my next question, actually. I was going to ask you about the fact that Marvin Hagler really doesn't seem to have anything to gain from this fight either. If he beats you, people are going to say, well, you beat a guy who hasn't fought for four years. And if you beat him, then all of a sudden he well, loses yeah. all, all the notoriety and all the public acceptance that he's been striving for for but so long. He has something to uh, obtain by beating me. He wants it bad. I mean, he, we both stated, we were at my restaurant, Jameson's, and he said, Ray, it would have been a big fight if we had fought. It can happen now. It can't happen two years down the road. It's understandable that you feel you have unfinished business. And of course, every time Marvin Hagler goes out there, he's got something to lose, but he doesn't have $10 million to gain as he might against Ray. But the question has to be asked because people are going to ask it. The risk to the eye. How do you feel about that? Well, you know, everyone has been stating that, Ray, I advise you not going to the ring. But these people have no knowledge whatsoever in ophthalmology. I have an ophthalmologist who's given me the clean bill of health. And Larry, another thing, in fact, I had extensive examinations. I'm 2020. People still bring it up as an issue. Um, it was it was misinterpreted that I said that Marvin Hagler would go for my eye. That's the least thing on his mind. If he didn't think he's concerned about my left jab. <laughs> I was just going to say, what now, if anything, is the status of the negotiations? Where does the fight stand? Is there any talk? Is there any talk, rumblings at all other than just what we read in the newspapers about a fight? There is major interest, I know, I, from a Hagler standpoint, from a Petronelli standpoint. For all the people that's not involved in the promotion, quite naturally, they don't want it to happen. But um, so far, everything is up in the air. You've answered all of my questions, Ray. Okay. <laughs> well, all right, I'll ask you one, one more thing, too. What happens if you do beat Marvin Hagler? Where do you go that's up? Well, can you just sort of turn your back from him and say, okay, I've done it and I'm out of it? I'm glad you asked that question because normally, because I've made two come, well, one comeback, really, and I say, I'm retired, then I come back, and people, you know, it's like the boy cry wolf. I become... They con I contradict myself, they say. But I say one fight with Hagler. Hagler will retire to this fight, and I will retire to this fight. Does it bother you that the nation's press has not been real kind to all of this? How does that make you feel? I know you pretty well, and I know you're a sensitive guy. I'm a sensitive guy, but also I, I look at the source. <laughs> you really well, have to we're all the source. just terribly sensitive guys here. <laughs> we're very but sensitive we're talking guys. about a lot of bucks, and we're talking about a guy that, that that feels that uh, he once did something as well as anybody that I've seen has done it. And there's this unfinished business to, to attend to. Thank you, Larry. Larry. <laughs> well, that's the way it is. <laughs> so we will likely then, I think it's fair to say, see a Sugar Ray Leonard, marvelous Marvin Hagler fight. Tonight, we saw perhaps the next heavyweight champion, Mike Tyson, as he won a unanimous decision over Mitch Blood Green. And we want to remind you to join us for our next presentation of World Championship Boxing. WBC lightweight champion Hector Macho Camacho defending his title against former champion Edwin Rosario right here in Madison Square Garden. That's Friday, June 13th, 10 o'clock Eastern.